Brexit means Brexit, and we're going to make a success of it. It was a national vote, it was a national referendum, and Parliament has to respect that. The working class have spoke, and I'm one of them, and I'm with them. I think the people in this country have had enough of experts. The time when people trust politicians, that's over. This is painful, and it will be for a long time. Can you give us a question? I'm can you, not going to give you a can question. You stay, can you stay categorical? You are fake news. Sir. This is a Westminster bubble thing. What? Hello, I'm Claire Preecy from the Politics Department at the University of East Anglia. And welcome to this Politics at the Edge mini. Instead of our normal roundtable discussion, this time we're featuring highlights of a staff student debate, part of the Politics on Wednesday series. And this week we've been talking about Brexit and the psychology of uncertainty. We've been discussing if the volatile nature of our politics offers opportunities as well as threats. Let's start with Dr Sally broughton Mikova, who's confessed to feeling this whole thing pretty hard to deal with. I think I, I am still very, very angry, and I try to get to where that anger comes from and this issue of the anxiety, because I did feel like I was sort of part of something, participating in things, like I was part of it and then now I feel like I don't even recognize what's going on in politics I you know I I don't have almost anybody I could get behind Um, I don't feel like my views or voice are represented in any way but the thing that keeps me angry (laughs) is is the short term you know, because the anxiety that I feel like a lot of us feel, and I've, and I've talked to a lot of people who voted leave and who are, have similar now anxieties because it doesn't seem like anyone knows the heck what's going on, as was pointed out. We have a deadline here and nobody knows what it's going to look like. And so the very personal insecurities of what's going to happen and anxiety over what things are going to look like in June for any of us are actually um, kind of shared. <laughs> I, I suspect we are all, or most of us anyway, in this room are, are Remainers and I feel that same sense of anxiety that others have talked about both personally and, and politically. I mean, the sense that that anxiety is being exacerbated by the, the, the appearance of a, of a government that doesn't seem to be in control of the events that are going to determine our future. So I think that's another aspect of of the anxiety that we may be feeling. But what I was wondering about was whether if we were a room of leavers, we might be talking about the anxiety we felt in the run-up to the vote and that our sense of status uncertainty, our focus on immigration as a cause of change in our communities was causing anxiety which was itself expressed. In, the, in that vote and whether the, the anxiety that we experience now is a kind of mirror image of the anxiety that might have been felt by, by people who wanted to leave and I just, it seems to me that f- emotion is quite a powerful one in politics and I wondered whether it is true that we could see anxiety as determining the way leave us thought and I'm looking to Aitken as our expert on public opinion. Thank you John. Um, well I, I mean there's been a lot of <laughs> studies recently as a response to what's been going on on the effect of anger and, and anxiety on politics. And it's a very, very s- strong predictor of, of political behavior. We're starting to understand now how effective these emotions are in politics. A lot of groups in society have been feeling anxious for a long, long time. Um, and, 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 and that came into sort of the one moment of vote that, to, that gave them the opportunity to, to actually express that. Um, it's, it's, been, it's been many years in, in, in coming, and now we're seeing that the lever's anxiety has been intense and concentrated. We're starting to experience it now. We don't know when it's going to end. We don't know whether there's a solution. We don't know whether another referendum is going to, leave, to, to lead to a different sort of result. This, this power of anxiety is something we, we, we're talking about and studying for, for years. Yeah. That question about anxiety and the the natural human emotion that you feel as uh, when there's uncertainty and i think there's there's kind of two layers of uncertainty here one is the kind of uncertainty about what might actually happen but there's a sort of deeper level of uncertainty about 
where the country is actually going. What is the vision for the country over the next 5, 10, 20, 50 years? And that's, that's a much more deep and existential um, source, of, source of anxiety. I wonder whether we need a bit more conversation about our vision for the country. Where do we see the country going? How do we see the country being governed? How do we see the country uh, making a living? What sort of jobs are we going to do? How are we going to look after our old people? How are we going to protect our rivers and our air? So I'd like to kind of throw back to Beth <laughs> and say, what's your vision for Britain? And also to throw that open to, to others as well. What do you think? I, I had a glimmer of hope with this new setup of this party, the independent party, that actually people from different parties started to say, well, look, we need to look beyond our party politics. We need to look at the future as a collective. So I hope that we go away from party politics and go more towards what issues do we need to address and how can we have more consensus politics? I think I'm going to diverge slightly from what Beth was talking about and just talk about the uh, opportunities that I think in the post-Brexit world. Um, and um, I did a parliamentary report for Clive Lewis with Toby uh, last year on Brexit in Norwich. Um, and the results were overwhelmingly that businesses were worried uh, and they've been impacted by Brexit. But then you go and talk to a Brexit supporter and you offer them the evidence and they you know, don't really listen or they reject it because they are holding on to something subjective. So for me, I agree with the need to discuss where we're heading as a nation, but I think it exposed this issue of identity uh, in Britain and who we see ourselves as. Um, I speak to Remainers, unlike myself, who see ourselves as European before British, but then you speak to Leavers who are looking toward a, an identity of Britain that possibly has never existed either. I think that both sides are going to come to a position where neither of those identities are feasible. I applied for the civil service fast stream and I didn't get I didn't quite get through but I got I was going through the project delivery strand specifically and pretty much every step of the way whenever I spoke to either someone who was a project engaged in project delivery in the civil service or some of the, the people the very people interviewing me for example were saying yeah Brexit we're going to need a lot of project management specialists. And then this, this, is, this area has only really shot up in the last six months when people have started to realise, pardon my language, holy shit, we don't have anything in place. It scares me a little bit that maybe getting a job overseas might be a bit harder. Like, I'd really like to work in Germany, so I'm looking at whether that will be possible or as easy as it has been. But then also looking at jobs on the other side, at the moment, there's so many jobs surrounding Brexit and with the civil service and things like that. Although it could be argued a bad thing, it has also opened up a lot of graduate jobs for us. Quickly to follow on with Jasper's excellent point, I think it would have been great if the referendum, which was advisory, had been used to kick off that kind of a conversation which we so desperately needed to have here. I mean, that could have been the beginning of a conversation where we actually talked about identity, where we actually talked about why so many people felt left out, left behind, et cetera, the way I'm feeling now, right? Um, and that would have been great. I Probably there isn't enough time to have that between now and if there is a people's vote, that doesn't seem likely. And also the height, the tension is so heightened. I was watching the BBC News another day, and it's a very interesting news framing. They first they reported uh, Honda, oh, the car maker, is pulled out, it's like closing down factories in the UK, and three, six, seven jobs will be lost. I don't remember exactly brand, but it's a Japanese car company, it's closing down because of Brexit. And the right after that news, and it's uh, the news about Huawei wants to offer more investment into the UK. And now I think the problem has led to whether the government is willing to offer China this opportunity while knowing that it could be a, a security uh. issue in terms of technology, or they could be very desperate for investment. Three quick points, maybe. I want to pick up on Susan. Um, I think Honda and Nissan, as long-standing investors in this country, are adapting basically to the international environment and they are not leaving Britain because of Brexit. Um, this is a, a kind of misinterpretation of 
Japanese foreign policy and of, of the interests of those companies. And I think if you look at, at, in greater detail at, at the, the kind of statements that Honda and Nissan make themselves, they obviously would prefer that Brexit didn't happen, um, but they are not shutting down plants as a result of Brexit. This is much more to do with the kind of global economy and changes in the structuring of their companies. Um, but related to that, uh, Japan also, as a, as a country which has just signed one of the largest agreements in history with the European Union in terms of trade, um, would also like to see stability and a certain amount of conformity. And this kind of brings me back to a point that Beth made on the idea of, of um, kind of consensus politics. And I think, and I completely agree that, you know, party politics doesn't work very well in this country and we probably didn't get the result we wanted in lots of respects around Brexit. But I'm very wary of the idea of promoting consensus politics because as somebody that's lived half their life in a country where consensus politics utterly dominates, I mean, the LDP in Japan has you know, been basically a, created a one-party state with the guise of a liberal democracy, that results in certain kinds of policy trajectories that have no real accountability um, and ends up representing the interests of a certain sector of the society and not of the average citizen on the street. Um, I, because I've got a touch of the Pollyannas about me, I'm really encouraged that there is some optimism coming through because uncertainty can um, be potentially uh, creative and I think if it's sort of going to force us to have some of these quite difficult discussions about who we are, where we want to go either as a, you know, individuals or as you know, societies, social groups, whether we want to look towards a more internationalised identity, what the dangers are of that, whether we want to look into more um, of an active grassroots regional participatory forms of politics, whether there's a combination. These are actually potentially exciting. Now, admittedly, if we continue on, in my opinion, with the current government, that some of those more exciting elements may not happen. Um, however, that sort of, and I'm looking again towards the sort of student cohorts, that's kind of going to be increasingly more in your hands, what, what, will, what will happen and what could happen. So potentially, yes, things are uncertain, but I'm quite encouraged that uh, there is still things to be optimistic about and things to fight for. Well, that was Sophie Scott-Brown, who teaches philosophy at UEA, ending that debate. Our student contributors were Jasper, Rosa and Josh. We also heard from Beth Dirks, Ra Mason, John Street, Etan Zelgov, John Tempany and Susan Wang. We'll be back soon with another discussion, so please do subscribe to our feed, tell your friends on social and check out our website, ueapolitics.org.